I guess I don't have to look up there anymore. How's everybody doing this morning? Let's open with a word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for who you are. And we understand that uh, our finances and handling our time and talents, all those things are important, Lord. And help us to do that in a way that uh, reflects you throughout our entire lives. Help us to learn things that we didn't know, that the things that you said in Scripture about our money and how important those things are. Thank you, God, for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. As you guys know, financial peace is coming up. And uh, when we, when Andrew and I started talking about doing this series, actually initially, um, I said, Andrew, I know I didn't get, or I had a sermon series coming up of my own, and I asked him, can I do a series just before financial peace? And, uh, and I was going to do it all on finances, do probably three sermons, because Lord knows you can, I could go all day on it. But, um, and then that's, that's kind of what sprung into this whole series, was me asking about this, because this is, this is important for us to be abnormal about. Is it, is it up? And let me tell you, when, when we are handling our money God's ways, it's very, very abnormal. And in fact, some people within the church, not necessarily this one, uh, but previous churches that Kayla and I have been to and served at, looked at us like we were weirdos uh, for, for doing this. But in the grand scheme of things, much like Kim and Tyler because we live by these principles, because we have our emergency fund and we save and things like that, the uh, Tina and Andrew can tell you, this last six months hasn't been easy for Kayla and me either. We've having to remodel a house. We've had to put $3,000 into both cars in the last three months. The only reason we're able to do that and still keep our head above water is the fact that we live by the principles that I'm going to touch on today. We live by them. And when those things come up, guess what? We have the money to take care of it, and it doesn't stress us out. Does that make sense? So Kim and Tyler had a rough year, and as soon as theirs was over, we started having ours. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> and ours is almost over, hopefully. <laughs> but let's talk about what is, what is stewardship. Stewardship has been developed into a Christian word, okay? And a lot of times when it is preached in most churches, not necessarily in this one, but in most churches, when it is preached about, most of the time, their stewardship really means we need a new building, so you need to give. <laughs> now, let's be honest. <laughs> yep. So, uh, so what does stewardship really mean? Stewardship comes from the Dark Ages when kings, kings and queens and royalty, knights and all of them, they had what they called a steward. And a steward is the person that managed their money, okay? About the time of the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation, Christians picked up that word stewardship adopted it as an understanding that it's all God's and we are to manage God's money. 
and God's possessions. So it stems from that word. So we are to be God's stewards. And that's what stewardship really is. It's not a building campaign. (laughs) You need to give so we can build a new building. That's not what it is. So we are to be stewards of God's property. And that's a concept that is lost for the most part in our culture, in our world. And that's one of the things that Financial Peace University teaches to do. It teaches you how to be good stewards with God's money. (laughs) And it teaches you why it's God's money um, in the last lesson. Anybody know what Psalm 5010 says? I just use it as a reference, but it says, I own a th- the thousand cattle and all of the hills that they're on. And it's God speaking to David in that. Um, that's not an exact quote, but that's generally what it is. What is normal? We're going to go through a lot of what is normal. Normal is broke. And... In this, in the, in the, Andrew and I were talking, and I was like, normal is really broken. But when it comes to finances, it's definitely broke. Normal is broke. None of us have any money to do anything with, right? That's normal. No matter what your income is, like you saw in the little financial peace advertisement, most households, regardless of income, live paycheck to paycheck. It's like 70%, I think, something like that. That's just embarrassing. I can't even imagine making, say, six figures and not having anything to do and not knowing where it went. That just doesn't make sense to me. So normal is broke. Why is that? Why is normal broke? Instant gratification. We have to have everything right when we want it. That's the biggest problem. We can't save up for it and buy it later on, but instead we put it on Mr. American Excess, and I did steal that from Dave Ramsey. American Excess, (laughs) or uh, he's got names for all of them, it's funny. Anyway, we're gonna look at a whole lot of scriptures today, so just be ready. Proverbs 22.7 says, the rich, rule over the, poor, blah, the rich rule over the poor, and the debtor, or the borrower, borrower, is slave to the lender. Slave to the lender. I don't know if you guys remember, but Paul says, come on. Romans 13.8, let no debt remain, out, remain outstanding except continuing debt of love to one another. For whoever loves others is fulfilled the law. So Paul says, don't let any debt outstanding except your love for your brothers and sisters. So what does that say? The Bible talks about debt quite a bit, so we're not going to go into all of it. But in no form is it ever talked about in a positive light. Many times in Proverbs, many times in Proverbs, It refers to debt as being foolish. As only fools carry debt. And we wonder how, I don't know if you've noticed, but some of a lot of those Old Testament characters, a lot of them had a lot of money. Did you guys notice that? Or not necessarily money in our traditional sense, but wealth, whether it be through cattle, land, or whatever it is. But a lot of them had a lot of wealth, especially in the Old Testament. New Testament, not so much, but they had wealth in different ways. Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit. Surely his haste leads to poverty. So our impatience in this culture is what leads us towards poverty. And the fact that we don't have a plan 
which is the worst part. And the fact that we don't have a plan leads us to poverty. No matter what we make, no matter what our income is, high or low, if we don't have a plan, somehow the money just flies out the door and we don't even know where it went. In Financial Peace University, Dave says, if you, and he does this on his radio show all the time, if you worked for you incorporated, would you fire you? Think about that for a second. If you were the money manager for you incorporated, would you fire you? <laughs> Suspension. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we fix the problem? How do we fix the problem of debt? The first thing is we have to change our mentality of we can't go into more. Okay? The second thing, the Bible actually says how. Proverbs 6, 4, and 5. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like the bird from the snare of a fowler. That is how you get out of debt. You have to hate it enough. Have you guys ever seen on Discovery Channel one of those gazelle, cheetah chasing a gazelle? During FPU, he actually, Dave goes into this more and shows a video of them running around and while he's talking about it. But that not that... You have to, it's a matter of life and death. You have to run. You can't just sit there because they're after you. People are after your money constantly. What else is normal? And we talked about this. Lack of contentment a little bit. We are not happy with what, where God has put us. We are not content uh, Dave's daughter, Rachel Cruz, actually wrote a book, Love Your Life, Not Theirs. And it's about the social media, how, well, it, in it, it's a, talks about how social media, and we're trying to be, live up to the Joneses. You know, everybody's showing their best and bragging about what they have and what they, what they just bought and all this other stuff. It's out there everywhere. And we cannot, we cannot, as people of faith, do that. What we have is God's. It's not necessarily to say we can't ever have nice things, because God wants us to succeed and have nice things. But we have to be content on where we are and realize it's all his. And the concept of him being able to take it all back is real. <laughs> it is real. And if, it, if we have the mentality in our heart that it's all his and he decides to take it back and we're content with him and him alone, then it's okay if he takes it back. What do you think the chances of him taking it all back if we're serving after him, his own heart, are pretty slim? If he does, it's going to be temporary. Look at Job. He took everything he had, but what did he do after his faith, Job's faithfulness? He gave it all back, plus some. So we have to remember that. That is a financial principle. But we're going to look at Philippians 4.12 through 14. I know what it is to be in need. This is Paul speaking. I know what it, I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's the famous, a very famous verse, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So Paul was content no matter what situation he was in. He trusted that God's going to take care of him, and he worked constantly to spread the gospel. And that content attitude and his love for Christ is what got him through all of those times, good and bad. Here's another one, 1 Timothy 
6, 6 and 7. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we, bought nothing, we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. It's talking about physical things, but there is one thing you can take out of this world, and that is the promise of the gospel, Jesus Christ. And that's not really a thing, but it is, we do take it out of this world. What is normal? Selfishness. We've done sermon series on selfishness. So we'll just touch on it briefly. Selfishness. Proverbs 21.20. The wise store up choice food and oil, and olive oil. Emergency fund, that's what that's talking about. But fools gulp theirs down, or devour. In some translations it says devour all they have. Only fools don't save for a rainy day. Only fools don't save so they can retire with dignity. Romans 8, 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit, have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Let me tell you, it is a lot easier to focus on what the Spirit desires if we don't, if all of our money isn't going to someone else. It is a lot easier if we're, because we can focus on prayer instead of worrying about our money. And if we're going to have enough to keep the lights on. Proverbs 18.21. An unfriendly person pursues selfish ends. There's a lot of Proverbs, isn't there? Hmm. I wonder if that's intentional. Anyway. An unfriendly person pursues selfish ends, and against all sound judgments starts quarrels. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinion. Anybody know anybody like that? (laughs) (laughs) So we can't be, there's many, many more scriptures on selfishness, trust me. That's just a few. But we have to be focused on what's important. We have to realize that it's all his anyway, and we cannot be selfish with what we have. Whether it be time, talents, and money, for sure. God calls us to be givers. We'll talk about that later. What is normal? Laziness slash wasting time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm guilty of this. Way too much. Way too guilty of this. James 13 and 14. Now listen, listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go uh, to this city or that. Spend a year there. Carry on business and make money. Why, why you do not even know <clears throat> what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You're in the midst. You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So we need to take advantage of the time that God has given us. And as good stewards, it's all God's time too. And we only have a limited amount of it. We don't even know how much of it we have. We don't know. And that's what this, part of what this passage says. We don't know how much time we have. So we have to take advantage of the time that we do have. Ephesians five fifteen through 17. Be very careful then how you, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. 
Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And I guarantee you, and I'm speaking to myself here as well, the Lord's will is not for us to sit and watch Netflix for 12 hours. The Lord's will is not for us to play video games for 24 hours straight. The Lord's will is not even for us to sit at work all day or all the time. He wants us to work. We need to work, but at the same time, we need to have, we need to be able following him. We need to be in our prayer. Paul says to pray without ceasing. What does that look like? It means our entire life is a prayer. And the last one for this, Proverbs 14, 23. All hard work brings profit, but mere talk leads to only poverty. So if we're not doing anything, then we're not going to accomplish anything. What a concept. (laughs) What's the right reason? God calls us to be givers. Givers of our time, givers of our talent, and givers of our money. If we look at if we look at the biblical characters in the Old Testament, they gave constantly. If we look at Acts chapter two, they gave everything to each other so they could worship. They sold all their possessions so they could live as a community and give to other people and help other people. Because they realize something, it's all God's. And God's want, God wants us more than he cares about the money. But at the same time, it's all his, and he can do what he wants with it. And it's our job to figure out what he wants us to do with it. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That is not the only place where it says, ask for it and you shall receive it. Jesus said that a couple of times. But we have to be in the right mentality. We have to be praising God through the process, and it's all his. And here's the verse that I really think is the, that shows God's ultimate heart. John 3.16, all of you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So if we're trying to model ourselves after God, we're trying to model ourselves. He wants us to model ourselves after him, right? If we're trying to do that, we need to step up the plate and be givers. He gave his only son, and we get, he asks us to give, us a, give the tithe. doesn't demand it, but he asks us. By the way, a tithe literally means a tenth. If you're giving more or less than a tithe, it's not a tithe. It's a tenth. (laughs) Not saying everybody has to give a tenth, but anything more is considered an offering. Anything less is considered an offering. A tenth is a tenth. It literally means (laughs) one-tenth. But that's a little rant. It doesn't matter how much you give. It really doesn't. But God wants us to model. That's a a guideline. A tenth is a guideline. But that is a model. He wants us to be a model of giving. Whether that be to the church or someone else, it doesn't matter. Most churches, when they talk about tithing, are like, give us money, give us money. No, that's not what it's about. It's about the heart of giving. If someone needs help and you have to, 
you have to give part of your tenth to that person to help them with that need, that's fine. <laughs> that's totally fine. What's the result of living this way? Open, to, open your Bibles to Matthew 25, because this is a little bit longer, so I'm not going to, uh, it's not going to be up there. Matthew 25, 13, or 14 through 30. This is the parable of the talents. Do you guys know this one, just off the top of your head? I won't. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. He's talking about what the kingdom of God is like. Who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money. To another, two talents. And another one talent, each according to his ability. Okay, so just so you know, do you guys know how much a talent is? A talent is a heck of a lot of money back then. Okay, a talent, the, the closest equivalent, I've had one talent was approximately $1 million, okay? So this guy was very, very wealthy. And he was going away, and he trusted uh, his servants to, to manage his money. And based on their ability, you notice there's, this is Jesus talking. Based on their ability, he let them manage it, Right? So what's this saying about us? Based on our ability, God allows us to manage certain things. That's not to say he promises us to be wealthy, but if we do a good job managing his money, we are more likely <laughs> to be blessed with more. Does that make sense? Okay. And that goes for time and talent, too. We are more likely to be blessed with more time to do other things to help other people when we are managing our time. Andrew and I talked about budgeting, and it would be interesting for us to look at a budget. We all know what a monetary budget looks like, right? It'd be interesting to model our time budget in a very similar manner to see what we're doing when and actually live by it that would be really tough but you know I think it can be done it can be done and we should think about trying it sometime I need to try it sometime I know I waste way too much time but anyway going on verse 16 <clears throat> The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So he invested it, basically. But the man who received one talent went off and dug a hole, uh, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned to settled, settled accounts with them. The man who received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, I, you entrusted me with five talents, and I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come, share your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, you entrusted me with two talents, and I have gained two more. The master replied, good, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. 
I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who received one talent came. Master, I, knew, I know you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathered where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent under the ground. See, here it is, what belongs to you. The master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you shall have put my money in a deposit with bankers so that when I returned, I would receive it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more. And he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a tough one. It's a tough one. So when God gives us something, what are we to do? We are to manage it. Dave, when he talks about this, I've heard him do a sermon, and he talks about this particular parable. And he compares it to having your hand open to having it clenched. So when we hoard, if we hoard our money, this is what we're saying. God, this is mine. This is mine, and I'm going to use it as I see fit. God wants us to have an open hand with our money. It comes in, it comes out, we handle it wisely so it typically comes in and we can give it and do, all, uh, do a lot of really cool, cool things with us. And God rewards us for that. It's not an accident that some employers actually check credit score before they hire you. Because what they're looking for is someone that cannot manage money. And there's a reason why. Because if they can't manage their money, they can't trust them with the things that they want to trust them with. It's an important thing. Managing our money is very important. It doesn't say exactly what the person with ten talents did, or five talents did. However, I guarantee you he invested it. He probably planted more crops. He probably expanded the territory that he had to do what he needed to do. He worked, and, he allowed, and it even says he allowed his money to work for him. And that can be a vast amount of things that we can do, whether it be giving, whether it be um, investing, whether it be saving for emergencies. These kind of things are all important. And when it comes, when we get to the end of our lives, I mean, there's a verse in Proverbs, and I didn't look this one up, but there is a passage in Proverbs that says, that we should leave an inheritance to our children's children. That's both financially and spiritually and just being a godly person. We are to leave an inheritance to our children's children. You know how much money it would take to leave an inheritance to our children's children in today's world? A lot. <laughs> But that implies that we're not supposed to waste it on worthless junk that won't be worth anything in the next week. 
So what is the purpose? Uh, actually, go back. What is the result? Dave, on his radio show, he ends it every day. He ends his radio show by saying, the only way to financial peace is through the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Because he realizes then unless you have peace in your heart through Christ, you're never really going to have financial peace. Yeah, there are atheists that live by the financial principles that are laid out in the scriptures because they realize that it works. (laughs) However, they won't ever really see true peace because that comes from only Christ. And that's one of the... It's one of the things in Financial Peace University, they teach, we teach, or Dave teaches all of it almost. They teach how to handle it so you have that peace, but you don't get that peace unless you have Christ. And that's really, really important to remember because that's, well, key. Okay, so what is the purpose? The purpose of doing the sacrificing it takes to get out of debt, the sacrificing of not throwing every penny away. The purpose is hope. Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. So if you don't have any hope, you're sick. <laughs> You're not well. But longing fulfilled is the tree of life. I want you guys to dream for a second, okay? Dream of what it would be like if you had everything paid off, you had no debt, including the house. What could you do? The only bills you have coming in are your utility bills. What could you do with what God has given you at that point? You're pretty much free, aren't you? You're free to give radically, radically give. There's a story in the old financial piece that they shared. Um, They don't have it in the new one. Kind of wish they did, but it took up too much time, I guess, and they were trying to shave off. Anyway, the giving lesson, which is the last lesson, it still is, but they had a story of a couple that wanted to adopt, and they had just finished their baby step three, which is the three to six months expenses, okay? So they're debt-free, and they have three to six months of their expenses in their savings account, okay? That's baby step three. They had just finished that. And they were saving up to adopt a child. Because I don't know if any of you guys know, it is kind of expensive to adopt a child. So instead of going into debt over it, they wanted to save up because they changed their mind about what debt is. So they wanted to save up and pay for the adoption. Well, they were almost there. And, uh, but a baby came. And they weren't quite ready yet. They were about $10,000 short. And uh, they were out at a restaurant, and they ran into some people from the church they were attending that they had barely known because they just moved into the area. They barely knew them. And they were telling them their story and how, you know, they were trying to adopt a baby because they couldn't have one and, you know, that, that normal stuff. And they were talking about how uh, they were saving up to so they could adopt the baby and cash flow, the adoption. Um, so they, and then they said their goodbyes or whatever after the dinner. And the next thing they knew, they had a trampoline in their backyard, which is one of the things that they said they were trying to get as well for their other kids. So they got home, and there was a trampoline sitting in their backyard. 
Somebody had bought them a trampoline for their kids. And then the next day, um, the next day, a car showed up in their driveway. They went out to see who it was or what it was doing. They handed them, in, the person handed them, and handed them an envelope, and then drove off. Didn't say what it was, they just handed them an envelope. They opened it up, it was a check for $10,000, which was the balance of what they needed to adopt the child. Which, to me, ever since I've heard that story, I've wanted to do that. I wanted to be in a position where I could give radically like that. To just say, you know, you're going on a good cause. I want to help you. Here's an enormous donation. <laughs> At this point in my life, I can't even fathom giving away $10,000. However, I pray one day that God will give me that blessing, that dream that I can give like that. And I think he wants you to be able to give like that. Because what a gift like that can change someone's life. And I guarantee you the couple that gave them that, it changed their life in a radical way as well. Jeremiah 29, 11. When I think of hope, I usually think of this, this passage. And most of you know it, so I didn't write it on here. You guys know what it is? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. That is one of the most famous verses, most famous promises. But we have our part to do to be able to receive that promise. We have to be a follower of him. Because he doesn't promise that if we're not a follower of him. And this is a realization I came to a while ago. That people, a lot of people, even people that don't have any faith go by some of these God's promises. God only promises anything to his followers. And I know that seems kind of harsh. The only thing he promises to unbelievers is salvation through Christ. That's the only thing he promises to unbelievers. So what's the purpose? Being an example. If we want to be like God, we have to give like God, whether it be your time, whether it be our talents. How, we are, how are we sharing with the people around us? How are we sharing with the community of God and even to strangers? How are we sharing? King David King David was, is known, is famous for being the man after God's own heart, right? And look what David went through. He was broke and broken. <laughs> Even after Goliath, he was praised, he was rich, he went down. He crashed hard and was hiding from Saul for a long time, even though he knew he was, God had called him to the throne. And then eventually he became very wealthy through his faithfulness, right? He was not a perfect man, but he always had God's heart. Always had God's heart. This is a quote that... Uh, we found in one of Andrew's devotional books that he got from somebody. The Lord narrows you to enlarge you. He reduces you to enrich you. I love this quote. So when you narrow yourself for the kingdom of God, he'll enlarge you. And that's part of what this whole getting out of debt thing is. You have to narrow yourself down to nothing. Like you don't buy anything. 
And we're not in debt other than our mortgage, and we're still pretty much narrow to nothing. And that's okay, because we're not wasting our money. <laughs> we have a plan. We've, uh, Andrew and Elizabeth have asked us to go out a time or two back in the day. I think they just quit because we don't always have the budget money. But we've actually, they've actually said, hey, you guys want to go out after church? And we've actually had to tell them, no, it's not in the budget. As much as we love them, if it's not in the budget, it's not in the budget. It's a no. Sometimes it is in the budget, and we can do stuff like that. But if it's not, it's not. It's a discipline thing. Remember Hebrews, Hebrews 12? No discipline is present, pleasant at the time, but it reaps harvest of righteousness. It's a discipline thing. We have to plan every penny that we use. And every minute of our day, we need to have at least some kind of plan and goal. How does this relate to the gospel? Every time I ask myself that, I say, how doesn't it? (laughs) Because if we're free to do what God wants us to do, whether it be financially or time-wise, if we're free to allow God to do what he wants us to do, being a good steward is all about the gospel. Because when God says go, we can go. When God says go to Africa, we can afford to buy our plane ticket and to feed ourselves while we're over there. We can afford to do it. We can afford to live without a paycheck for a month or whatever, however long he wants us to go over there. Because we were smart and handled his resources the way that he wants us to. Does this make sense? This does not come instantly. You make the choice to do it, and then it takes you probably years to do it. It took Kayla and I about four years to pay off $60,000. But four years is a lot shorter than what it would have taken. We know people that are our age that are still in student loan debt. And we haven't been in student loan debt for like, I don't know, almost three three or four years now. Something like that, I don't know. But let me tell you, when you kick Fannie Mae out out of the extra bedroom, it is nice. It is nice. It is a feeling you cannot get unless you pay off your mortgage and you don't have any payments. That, that, that would beat that. <laughs> Dave says when you pay off your mortgage, the grass is greener all of a sudden. I can see that. <laughs> I can see that. Chris Brown, one of uh, Dave's personalities. Uh, I would highly recommend you guys listen to his podcast. It is really, really good. He just did one about loneliness recently. It is amazing. Tina and I listened to it in the office the other day. It is really, really good. I would highly recommend it, recommend it, especially if you're dealing with loneliness, but all of us have at one point or another. Regardless, Chris Brown is kind of like Dave Ramsey in a lot of ways, although he takes it more from a pastoral perspective because he is a pastor or was a pastor until he had got this job. And he talks a lot because Dave is a hard hitting, sometimes very blunt. And uh, if you've ever listened to his radio show, he actually yells at people sometimes for being stupid and calls them stupid. Um, Granted, he always he always says, you know, I can, I can call you this because I am this. Because I've got my master's in D-U-M-B, he says. <laughs> However, Chris takes a different angle. Um, and actually, in that episode, a, a girl sent an email and said, I love Dave, and he's a kick in the seat of my pants that I need, and then you're the hug afterwards. That's kind of the way she described it. And it is true. Regardless, 
Chris, in one of his uh, podcasts, he talks about how God wants us to have margin in our lives. He wants us to have margin. So when those things come, it's not an emergency. When those things in life come that are stressful, we have a little bit of time to give to it for a little bit. We have a little bit of time to give back to God, whether it be through service or giving money. He wants, God wants us to have margin. And you can look at a lot of different biblical characters and just say, look, they had margin in their lives because they had the ability to say yes to God and not be enslaved to someone, some third party, worldly power. Sometimes it takes us to have work to get there. And the Spirit of God wants us to be free. He wants us to be free from debt. He wants us to be free from the banks. He wants us to be free to do what he calls us to do. And all of this, and that there's the margin, I did it backwards. All of this is very important because it frees us up to be the person that God has called us to be. So if you haven't already, if you haven't already and you want to learn about at least the money side of it, I would highly encourage you to sign up for FPU, Financial Peace University. I know I use FPU all the time and some people don't know what that is. But that will help you at least get the money side of it right. And it's amazing to me, when you get the money side of it right, it seems like the rest of it comes back. You know, you relate it to other facets of your life. When you're organized with your money, it's amazing how you become more organized with your time and, and your talents and your love for other people because it really, truly does free you up and you don't have to worry about as much. When you're not thinking about your money all the time, it's amazing what happens. When you don't have to check your bank account every other day to make sure you didn't overdraft on something, you have a different spirit about you. I know this because I am that. I check my bank account like once a month. <laughs> And that's just to balance it. <laughs> because we have a plan, and God has a plan for you and your money, and you know it. And we have to free ourselves up to be able to live that plan out. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for the ability to learn what it is to be a good steward of, what, of our time, our money, our talents, everything that you give us. And realize, help us to realize that it's all yours. Help us to realize that it's not about the money. Even doing our budget every month really isn't about the money. It's how can we glorify you with the resources that you give us. It's a tough world out there, God. Help us to be the example for you in every aspect of our lives, whether it be our money or time, our language, Send your spirit down on us to change our lives completely and not let us forget that it's all you. And if we want to be followers of you, we need to do what you and manage your things effectively. We love you. We thank you for all you do for us, regardless of our in insubordination. 
In your name we pray. Amen. Can I say one word of encouragement? You're, you're